We will be getting started in just a moment as I let folks come into the room. I'll say that I am very excited to have this conversation. It feels like a really pertinent topic for a really pertinent time, and I'm really thrilled to be speaking with such an expert on the topic. Um, our guest today is, is Eric Ward, and uh, Eric Ward is an expert on the relationship between authoritarian movements, uh, hate and violence, and preserving inclusive democracy. Folks <laughs> mute, let's mute everybody, and then... Okay, I have muted everybody, and then I will ask Eric to unmute himself in a moment. Uh, Eric Ward is an expert on authoritarian movements, hate and violence, racism, and how to preserve inclusive democracy. He's the author of multiple written works, um, including and very specifically, Skin in the Game, How Anti-Semitism Animates White Nationalism. He's been quoted in the New Yorker, the New York Times, the LA Times, the Washington Post, BBC, Rolling Stone, and much, much more. And is the 2020 re 2021 recipient of the Civil Courage Prize. Um, and I'm going to bring Eric into the room so we can see him. Hi, Eric. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, my friend. It's so great to see you. And um, really a pleasure to be with you. And it was very exciting to hear that you were coming to, to lead Fellowship of Reconciliation. And um, one of my favorite organizations. Um, uh, and so I was excited about that. And then, of course, when I received the, the, the invite, um, ecstatic to sit with you today. Wonderful. So if, if it's all right, we'll just kind of go ahead and get started. Yeah. And I want to start with a little bit of, I don't know if you've seen uh, this new book that's out, Safety Through Solidarity, by, I, I'm I'm really infatuated with the book and I think it's so well done. So I wanted to start by giving a little background of uh, reading a little section of the book that kind of set the stage for anti-Semitism on the left. So um, Ben Lorber and Shane Burley write uh, that the, they have often found the left's analysis of anti-Semitism and the commitment to fighting it to be sorely lacking. And they say, part of the reason for this for this lack is that anti-Semitism and Jewishness more broadly scrambles many of the categories progressives commonly use to understand identity and oppression. The left, quote, uses a model of anti-Black racism as a way to analyze whether or not Jews are oppressed, Dove Kent told us, and that completely ignores all the structural ways anti-Semitism operates. Being left doesn't stop white Jews from experiencing white privilege. And at this historic moment, Jews do not face structural levels of police violence, poverty, and other commonly understood effects of state-sponsored institutional racism as Jews. Jews who wear visible markers of Jewishness are more vulnerable to certain types of bigotry, but the majority do not wear those markers and are generally able to blend in an option not available to many other marginalized groups. And while many bigoted ideology, ideologies, such as anti-Blackness, tell a tale of group inferiority, anti-Semitic ideology imagines a cabal of all-powerful Jews pulling the strings from the height of society, a conspir conspir conspiratorial form of demonization the left is not used to countering. The result is that activists try to slot Jews into a series of ill-fitting categories, and some conclude anti-Semitism is little more than a white people issue, not worth taking seriously. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop it there. And uh, Eric, I'm wondering if you could start us off with how you got interested in this topic and a bit of your background um, of racial justice organizing. Yeah, no, I'm I'm happy to and. Thank you for reading that excerpt. Um, I got a chance, I should say, before even I jump in, um, I got a chance to actually sit with Ben and Shane. Uh, just, um, you know, when you get old, time uh, conflates and expands. If you, if you were older than 35 on this call, you know that to, uh, to be true. 
And, uh, but I'm guessing about two or three weeks ago, we got a chance to sit in Portland, Oregon at um, Powell's Books, Full House. Um, in, in fact, they had to stop people coming up uh, the stairs to the event because it was overflowing. Um, amazing conversation with Ben and, and uh, Shane. And I often tell folks um, that it's really important if, if particularly for those on the, who see themselves as the left and identify themselves, that uh, this is one book that I really highly recommend that uh, people sit with and, and wrestle, rip up the pages, take them back together. I really could not uh, um, recommend uh, a book knowing um, that if you sit squarely on the left, um, you are more likely to be able to wrestle with this than even my own essay that I um, penned in, in 2017 called Skin in the Game, how anti-Semitism animates uh, uh, white nationalism. And I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit about that. Again, uh, my name is Eric Ward, Executive Vice President of Race Forward, a longtime racial justice activist, um, I'm a, uh, an anti-racist, and uh, I commend um, Fellowship of Reconciliation for always providing a space to talk about these issues. Before I get into myself, too, um, this is a conversation. I just want to make a prediction. Um, it is a very challenging time in our world. I don't think I have to say that to folks who are on the call. And... Um, in those moments, we often don't take stock of the things that are happening or the things we've experienced and, and have come through together as a world, as communities, subcultures, fandoms, however we identify ourselves, movements. And so it's important to hold this. Not only are we a world on the edge of, uh, of immense global conflict. Uh, some folks talk about World War III it's represented by what is happening right now in Palestine, Israel, in uh, Ukraine, in Tigray, in uh, um, uh, uh, Mexico. We can point to places right here in the United States. Um, but there are other layers that we forget that we are carrying in this moment. We, have, we are in the midst of a global pandemic that has taken upwards to 9 million lives, and that is likely a conservative estimate, right, in less than six years. Um, we have dealt, uh, nearly every person on this call and around the world has dealt with some type of significant climate disaster at this point, whether we're talking about forest fires here in Portland, Oregon, we had to literally tape our homes up for eight days because we had uh, the worst air quality in the world. I'm gonna say that again. For eight days, Portland, Oregon in the United States of America had the worst eight, uh, air quality in the, in the world. It was so bad that it was unmeasurable. No one understands the long-term consequences, but we aren't alone whether we're talking about forest uh, floodings, um, uh, temperature changes. All of us have experienced deep freezes. Uh, many of us around the world are experiencing that and the loss that comes with it. And we haven't even talked about the political violence and polarization uh, that is happening not only in the streets of America, but, but around the world. All to say, or I just say that in the beginning because it's important to note uh, at the end of the day, we are human beings. And I know we think of ourselves as rational and highly functioning. Uh, those things we are, but we're also human beings. We are made up of feelings. And it is highly unlikely that many people are walking around on our planet right now, in our world, particularly those who care about the world and care about people who are not in an emotive state. And I don't know about others, but when I'm in an emotive state, I, it is not when I am doing my best rational thinking. I take it down to the most micro level. When I'm in an emotive state, it is typically not the best time to try to figure out solutions 
with my family, with my friends. I tend to speak from my emotions, not from our brain, but we're in a moment. And uh, while it's a hard moment, it's a moment that calls on us to choose whether we are going to be leaders for our communities, for our fandoms, right, for uh, our movements, or whether we will give away purely to just our emotions. And it's a it's a difficult choice point. And today you and I will get a chance about how we wrestle with that. The second thing I wanna say is as leaders, I can guarantee you if you are a real leader on this call, trying to be responsible, you will leave this call unsatisfied. I'm not saying you won't be uh, 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 more informed possibly. Uh, uh, you will likely have more questions, uh, but there is nothing we can say over the next hour that will completely satisfy and I suspect I will poke at each person in some way, intentionally or unintentionally. And uh, I apologize for that uh, in advance, but, but please know that if I'm speaking to you, it is because I am an individual who comes out of the anti-racist left of American politics. I am a child of the black radical project to transform this country from a segregated system of white supremacy to an inclusive democracy. That is what the generations before me, represented by FOR, marched, died, and were beaten for. And we are at that moment. And uh, everything I believe we are dealing with, primarily in this country, revolves around that question. Will we be an inclusive democracy? or will we become an exclusive authoritarian uh, state? How I came to that, so I'll say really quickly, um, how I came to understand this moment about the urgent threat posed to American democracy by white nationalism and, and political violence is from growing up in poverty in, in Long Beach, California. I found um, solace in the late 70s, early 80s, in the punk and music scenes in Los Angeles. And as a black punk rocker, I was part of a subculture that was under siege by the earliest manifestations of the white nationalist movement. What the country is dealing with was actually being experienced by my subculture in the 80s and 90s up until the 2000s. Racist punks and neo-Nazi skinheads organized and supported by adults and institutions. We had to defend our seat from uh, anti-Semitism before we even knew what it was or understood that it was the driving force behind the violence, harm, and intimidation we were experiencing. Those formative years, as I wrote about in Skin in the Game, taught me resilience and the importance of standing up against hate in the mid 80s, I moved to Eugene, Oregon in search of better opportunities. I was fleeing the war on drugs. I encountered stark racial discrimination in Oregon. Well, Oregon is often painted as a progressive state and aspirationally that is true. It has its own racial history. In the 1920s, it hosted the largest Klan west of the Mississippi. When I got to Portland, and sorry, to Eugene in the mid 80s, no one would hire me, despite my experience in this very liberal town. The only person who ended up hiring me ultimately was a conservative white Republican male uh, who decided to break the status quo. And uh, through our time together, I learned a really valuable lesson, right? That while politically we held different politics, and different ideology, our values were not as different. And when we focused on our values rather than our ideology, we found ways to move forward together. And so for me, my politics actually formed from coming out of the music scene that I had to defend and then moving from a diverse Southern California to a state where the black population was less than four to 5%. In short, I got a chance to experience white society and the challenge that it wrestles with each and every day 
around those who oppose racism and those who see racism as a part of the way society should function. And it framed much of my politics. Oh, sorry, muted. Um, so before we go into uh, anti-Semitism and white nationalism, I was really interested, and it was new to me when I was uh, reading some of your work, about the, the difference between white supremacy and white nationalism. So um, if you could start there, and then actually if you could go into as well, I was fascinated by um, kind of the history of the connection between uh, anti-Semitism and uh, anti-Black racism. Yeah, and, and I'll get into this because it is very useful. You know, the we should start first with the word anti-Semitism. And one of the things I'm going to say right now is um, it's amazing. Uh, uh, I remember um, after the events of 9-11, uh, where I was organizing with local communities and rural and urban areas in the Pacific Northwest, a bunch of us came together and we formed about 120 human rights groups uh, around the uh, around the Pacific Northwest, Wyoming, Montana, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, et, et cetera. And we were primarily responding to, to, to hate violence and hate crimes in those areas, organizing by the white nationalist movement. And um, when 9-11 happened, it surprised me how overnight uh, a country that had largely denied the existence of Islamophobia, the, the hatred of Muslims. All of a sudden, the next day, everyone seemed to be an expert on Islamophobia, right? Uh, all of a sudden, everyone knew what it was or what it wasn't. Uh, more importantly, they knew, uh, uh, interesting enough, why they weren't Islamophobic, right, in, in their comments. And so one of the calls of leadership is, is to actually enter space with um, uh, humility not positioning. And so I want to start from, from the beginning and uh, first talk about what anti-Semitism is. The first thing to, to know, and um, uh, the reason I even have to say this, is actually what I believe, the unconscious bias of anti-Semitism, right? But the word anti-Semitism wasn't created by Jews. <laughs> Jews did not capture the term anti-Semitism. And one day say, hey, we want to describe this as a way of talking about the prejudices we are experiencing, right? And so coming to Jews and saying, why are you using the word Semitic or um, uh, is like asking black folks why we talk about racism. We didn't invert the term racism or race. It's a made up social construction that was used to codify a system of oppressions. So the first thing I want to say on this, Paul, just because I know time is short, is stop asking Jews about Semitic languages. They didn't create this term. It was a word that was codified, right, by non-Jews to create a system of prejudices, right, to reinforce the hatred of Jews. The word anti-Semitism, in short, means prejudice against or hatred of Jews. It is. It was created, right, in the late 1800s in 1879 by a non-Jewish journalist, Wilhelm Marr. He originated the term anti-Semitism, denoting the hatred of Jews, and also the hatred, quote, of various liberal cosmopolitan international political trends of the 18th and 19th centuries. Sound familiar, right? Those international political trends of the 18th and 19th century, the rise of liberalism and cosmopolitanism was often associated with Jews, meaning liberalism, right, was associated with Jews. This trend, right, uh, continues equating Jews with civil rights, constitutional democracy, right, socialism, finance, capitalism, uh, uh, pacifism. It was a term to other Jews, and we'll get back to it in a bit, but I want to jump ahead a little bit and specifically ask your question. 
So this white nationalist movement, uh, I don't think have, I have to argue anymore, uh, uh, has reshaped American politics. It has driven a coalition that we know as MAGA or Trumpism into the White House, uh, uh, was part of a core coalition that nearly toppled uh, American democracy, or what I call three decades of Black civil rights struggle, uh, on January 6th. At the core of this white nationalist movement is something called anti-Semitism. And I often say it isn't just at the core of white nationalism. Anti-Semitism is the core of white nationalism. And it's so central to white, to white nationalism that I felt as a racial justice activist, as a lifelong anti-racist, that black people and other marginalized groups will never win our freedom if we're not also active in the struggle to uproot this form of anti-Jewish hate. And it is because amongst 21st century white nationalists, Jews are cast in the same role that they have always filled for anti-Semites as the absolute other, demons stirring a pot of lesser evils and the driving force behind white dispossession. At the foundation of the modern day white nationalist movement uh, is an explicit claim that Jews are a separate race and that their ostensible position as white is nothing more than the greatest trick that the devil ever played. Now hold for a second, because I need to remind people of something. Remember, there is no real biological definition of race. Race is a social construction. In short, racism exists. Race does not. But in the modern day white nationalist movement, this explicit claim that Jews are white, positions Jews in such a way that despite and indeed because of the fact they are seen as white, are placed as an enemy race that must be exposed and eliminated. It is that fantasy of invisible Jewish power that explains for white nationals how black Americans, or a race of supposed inferiors, could orchestrate the end of Jim Crow, or how feminists in the LGBTQ community could upend what are known as traditional gender roles, or even how immigrant workers could mount a challenge to economic inequality. Folks often ask me, Aaron, where is the anti-Semitism in the white nationalist movement? Where is it in Trumpism? And I point out that it's everywhere. When the Tree of Life shooter said Jews were committing genocide against white people, he was using language that was intimately familiar to his fellow white nationalists. Such rabid anti-Semitism is the framework in which the entire movement functions. And we're, and Jews aren't the only ones who actually experience anti-Semitism in that way. Even individuals like me who are non-Jewish, those who are non-Jewish on this call have experienced the violence of anti-Semitism. Whether we are talking about the shooter who attacked um, who, who shot Latino shoppers at a Walmart in El Paso, whether we're talking about African-Americans shopping in Buffalo, New York, or African-Americans worshiping in a church in, in Charleston, South Carolina, and, and killed, whether we're talking about festival goers at the Garlic Festival in Gilroy, California. Over and over, we have seen incidences of mass violence where the individuals have targeted Muslims, Jew, uh, Sikhs, white folks, Latinos, Blacks, uh, uh, South Asians. But at the core, what they have written in their manifestos is that anti-Semitism was the core of why they were acting out. The truth is, is that anti-Semitism impacts all of us, as do all forms of, and systems of oppression. Now, as I said, I'm an anti-racist first. I was raised to challenge racism. I come out of a community that has generationally positioned itself against white supremacy, either through survival or through the dreams of something better. And what we understand is to refuse to deal with any ideology of racial domination is to abet it. 
And that's why for us here in the United States, I believe fighting anti-Semitism cuts off the animating force of white nationalism for the sake of all marginalized communities. Let me stop there. Okay. Um, so I want to ask um, if you can, oh, I was trying to get both of us on screen. Let's see. Uh, there we go. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, I want to answer a question in the chat that, that asked, but aren't Jews white? And I want to say Jews are white, black, Asian, Latino, we come in all shapes, forms, and colors. Uh, it was both a religion and an ethnicity or a peoplehood. Um, but I wanted to ask it, two questions again. One, how you see um, anti-Semitism show up on the left uh, in progressive spaces, both before October 7th and currently, and also about, uh, there's this long, what I will call manufactured, um, tension between um, Black Americans and Jewish Americans. And has that, um, how has that manifested and played into your work and research? Yes. I it makes the conversation on anti-Semitism difficult, right? Um, uh, 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 again, you have to start with the notion that the entire notion of race doesn't make sense. Uh, if you do not understand, in fact, if you believe in biological definitions of race, that makes you a white supremacist. Maybe not a hardcore conscious white supremacist, right? But the idea that race exists as a biological definition is a white supremacist notion. Now, so let's 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 start start with the premise that race itself is confusing because it doesn't make sense. And I'm gonna make it even more confusing before I answer this question. In truth, by the way we define uh, uh, race and, and people in the United States today. You know, uh, the majority of Jews in the United States are actually folks we would have considered people of color until the late 1800s and the early 1900s, right? So uh, uh, it just is confusing upon confusing. Not all Jews are white, right? Uh, whiteness is a, a European uh, uh, a definition and, and, and context. So the easy way to think about this is uh, whiteness is fluid. Uh, people have been made or unmade uh, in terms of whiteness throughout the history of the United States, right? So there's, I often talk about at the um, uh, Apple, is it Appleton, Wisconsin? There's a great historical society there. They have a great letter from this German guy who had immigrated there uh, in the 1800s who was uh, cutting trees or planting trees, I'm not sure which one. And he was writing home to his family, telling them what it was like. And he says in the letter, it's great, life is great here. Uh, there's only one problem. I'm the only white person here, he says. Everyone else is Swedish, right? So uh, uh, because there was a moment, now, not in the way that black folks were made unwhite, perhaps, but there is a moment where if you were Swedish, you weren't considered white in America. There was a time when if you were Mexican in the Southwest of the United States, you were considered white. And there was a moment that you weren't. And I'll bring it up to even more recent times. Uh, I often tell folks, if you want to understand the fluidity of, of whiteness, look at the events of September 11th. September 10th, the national consensus was in this country that much of Arab America was seen as white. And I can tell you on September 13th, with the racialization of Islamophobia, the hatred of Muslims, right, that uh, Arab Americans were no longer considered white in America. It's a fluid piece. And for Jews, they have their own history with whiteness with privilege, and sometimes we conflate um, network, right, uh, with privileges, 
that just make it hard to understand. But the short is, is that uh, some Jews, right, some Jews in America of European descent are seen as white to the extent, right, that they're not seen as Jewish. And what I've often argued is the more that Jews hold and assert their own culture, their own identity, they begin to receive backlash around that identity, right? Uh, white folks don't typically receive backlash, right, for claiming their identities. Uh, white folks don't go to bed at night wondering if their cemeteries or their houses of worship will be targeted. White folks don't have to think about if they're white or not and ponder it and debate it. It is the privilege of being white is to not have to think about it, right? And uh, so in this way, whiteness is a fluid conversation within the Jewish community that is as complicated as it is for the Arab American community and for Latino communities in this country. But the unconscious strand, and I promise I'm gonna shut up here, but I wanna point out that the unconscious strand of anti-Semitism runs through that conversation as well. Because the same challenges that Arab American and Latino communities wrestle with, even Native communities wrestle with, around the nature of whiteness, is seen as an honest debate, an honest wrestle. But when the Jewish community has to wrestle with it, it's seen as somehow nefarious or not above board. And that, to me, is the unconscious form of anti-Semitism. Because white nationalists didn't bring anti-Semitism into our country or into our communities. They're merely like every other form of bigotry, tapping into what already exists. If anti-Semitism didn't exist in American society, I can tell you as an organizer, white nationalists wouldn't be trying to tap into something that didn't exist. They're trying to put organization to an issue that they believe will help them build power, just like us, their organizers and strategies. And we very much see white nationalists right now today infiltrating and trying to stake claim in the Palestinian rights yeah. movement. And at the same time, I would argue that we also see, and, and Ben and, and Shane argue as well, that uh, we see a dismissiveness of anti-Semitism mm -hmm of saying that's not important because a genocide is taking place or you're imagining it or it's not really happening. And and one of the most stark examples of this uh, in recent days or weeks was a resurgence of the term uh, ZOG, the acronym Zionist Occupied Government being used by uh, some left members, some members of the left, and then who, and then there was a large defending of that. So if you could talk about the, the left's the, the left, how the left grapples, which I think includes this question of of where power is held, right? Especially in yeah. this current moment. Yeah, it's super difficult, right? So again, I want to go to start with the emotive, um, you know, uh, those who are most impacted, right? Um, tens of thousands of, of people have been uh, uh, killed. Um uh, displaced um, in a region, right? Uh, people have had family members who have been taken and not, you know, not returned. Um, uh, you, you know, uh, for anyone who has spent any time in that region, uh, one of the most beautiful, magical spaces one could imagine uh, in the world is uh, living on the verge of of horror and. Uh, you would have to be the coldest person in the world to, to not uh, uh, hold or feel that uh, uh, in this moment. But it is in those emotive cracks that um, our biases tend to come forward. I know this as a racial justice trainer for, for decades. I have led trainings. One of the things we know is that bias, particularly unconscious bias, is most likely, right, to manifest when people feel they're under great pressure. And we are a world that is under great pressure. 
It's why most police shootings of black, unarmed black men and women and non-binary occur in these moments where police perceive themselves to be under great stress. You begin to imagine other things, biases creep in, and it's a moment that we're in. And in that creep is where unconscious anti-Semitism and unconscious Islamophobia have begun to make themselves manifest on the left. What makes it challenging, in my opinion, uh, Ariel, and I have much more, if you want to ask more questions on this specific topic, I have much to say, but the thing that really strikes me is two challenges for those of us on the left. And it's why I love uh, Shane and Ben's book. I don't agree with every argument they make. They are arguments worth debating and having conversation. And they are arguments we should all be aware of um, because they make us better leaders. And the two things I will add to this is it's a hard conversation to have around anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Because in the United States, they have become two racialized forms of bias, I would argue. But we're trying to have it amongst the left that mostly doesn't understand racism anyway, right? So how do you have a conversation about two more obscure forms of racism within a social movement that doesn't have a good grounding and understanding around the dynamics and the systems uh, um, of, of race? The other piece that I think makes it a challenge, right, is, um, you know, we in the left, largely, I'm not going to beat up, a lot of people beat up on us anyway, so I don't need to beat up on us. Um, but we've been siloed and we have self-isolated ourselves over the last 40 years. We have cut ourselves off and in many ways, we have created our own subculture, right? And in that subculture, we don't believe we walk around with serious unconscious bias. We think somehow we are immune from the biases that exist in society at a large that we recognize really clearly, right, uh, on the extreme edges of society, like in the far right. The, the truth is, is it's twofold. So I'll answer it this way. The problem now, uh, for serious leadership on the left is A, the white nationalist movement has been successful. And in its success culturally, it has mainstreamed a set of ideas and values, right, that have been absorbed by the entire society of America. Two, we on the left somehow think we are not part of that society and that we have not absorbed those same uh, uh, ideas and conditionings. But I'll give an example. Uh, one, anti-Semitic and Islamophobic hate violence is at an all-time high. Now, we don't have to use the data from the Anti-Defamation League. There's lots of other data that we can point to that show, even if we take out the, the things we have questions around, like protest and uh, um, uh, things said, right? Uh, Anti-Semitic and Islamophobic hate crimes are at an all-time high. Let me say that to the 173 people listening right now. Anti-Semitic and Islamophobic hate crimes are at the highest level of record ever, right? Two, political violence has mainstreamed itself in American society in lots of significant ways. We have seen it, right, with folks who have tried to infiltrate protests, folks inside of protests, the shovings, the fights, right? Not all of that is made up. We've seen it on video. Those things are really happening. People have been killed, right? Both Jews and Muslims attacked physically. Those things are happening. Three, we are watching the closing of public space, people being fired from their jobs, right? Uh, 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 protests being made illegal, all of these things happening. And I have to always step back and tell folks, here's the catch. If you want to know how successful the white nationalist movement is, it is so successful that it's not the white nationalist movement doing those things right now. 
It's our own leadership creating and normalizing a set of values and practices that we would find wholly abhorrent if MAGA or the alt-right or white nationalists were out there engaging in them. That is an absorption, right? Again, I'm not saying that makes the left bad. That's happening across society. But what I'm saying is, is in our arrogance, we are absorbing the cultural gains of the white nationalist movement. And our arrogance prevents us from creating ways of creating blockage and resilience from that within our own communities and, and movements. It's one way where we have fallen seriously as leaders in this moment in terms of showing up for our communities. We are doing things that the white nationalist movement will only take advantage of if it ever gets back into power. So I, I wanna move over to there. There's a um, frequently uh, the racial, uh, the anti-Black racial justice movement is pitted in many ways against uh, Jewish liberation. And we can look at uh, the Crown Heights riots of yeah. 1991. Um, we can look at uh, the Louis Farrakhan issue that took over so much of the Women's March. And, and I want to preface this by, by uh, clarifying that uh, anti-Semitism is very much a European Christian construct. Uh, not that there haven't been incidences of anti-Jewish violence or hatred throughout the world, throughout history, or all kinds of religious conflict or violence, but anti-Semitism as it is defined and as we think of it comes out of European Christianity. Therefore, you know, immediately putting, uh, you would think, wouldn't be um, cre you know, wouldn't place Jews and Black Americans at opposite ends, and yet in many at, in many times that appears to be the case. And if you could speak to that, yes. Uh, again, it's um, it is one of the important debates that are happening now. Uh, for me, I I'll give my my own opinion here, right? Um. Um, I think anti-Semitism, the term anti-Semitism, is a specific form of anti-Jewish bigotry. It is a form of anti-Jewish bigotry that was uh, developed, right, in the uh, late 1800s, or not developed, but became a, a, a primary form of anti-Jewish bigotry in the late 1800s, and it positioned Jews not as a religious or ethnic other, but as a racialized other, right? And we see its roots going as far back to the Iberian Peninsula, right? In the um, uh, uh, 15th century, right? Where Jews are first racialized uh, along, um, uh, uh, during the Inquisition and during that period but it really takes form in the 1800s. So it becomes one form of anti-Jewish uh, uh, bigotry. And it of course has become a catch-all now for all forms of, of anti-Jewish bigotry. But the truth is, is at its core, when I'm talking about anti-Semitism, I'm specifically talking about the form of anti-Jewish bigotry that positions Jews as a racialized other. It is a in, it is a form of racism that we are contending with. And outside of anti-Semitism, we deal with the intercommunal tensions that exist in any society amongst religious minorities, amongst ethnic minorities that we see each and, and every day. But the third is, is that anyone can absorb anti-Semitism, right? Even other marginalized communities. As we know, one can be anti-racist and still be sexist or, or homophobic, ask the Nation of Islam, right? Uh, uh, it is an anti-racist organization. I don't think we would frame it as progressive, right? And it deals with uh, uh, real issues around misogyny and 
and uh, other forms of bigotry. I use that as an example, but there's lots of examples at organizational and individual levels. In, in the same way, one can be opposed to one form of bias by perpetuating another. And uh, sadly, we have seen that in terms of relationships between Blacks and Jews, right? But it often then gets used by the broader public, right? The broader public loves the idea of marginalized communities going after one another, right? Because it conditions this idea that then the system of racism, right, must be okay. Because look, everyone has some kind of prejudice. Look at black folks being anti-Semitic. Look at Jewish folks being anti-black. Look at Koreans being Islamophobic. Look at Arab Americans being anti-Asian. We can't, and our system can't be that bad if these things are happening. The, the truth is, is that we have to oppose all forms of racism, no matter how they manifest themselves here in the United States. That's how we begin to build a broad-based uh, multiracial coalition. Two, we have to spend time wanting to live in a little bit of confusion and not easy answers. This is not a 30-minute sitcom, right? Folks, I, you know, my parents talked about this when I was a kid. Look, fighting racism, surviving racism is not a 30-minute happy day episode where you get sad 15 minutes in and then everything gets tied up nicely at the end. That's not humanity. That's not our world. We are messy feeling creatures, but we can lead with our hearts. And our hearts tell us each and every day, right, that violence, right, and bigotry are not the solutions. That showing up and modeling a different set of behaviors is critically important, but we have to be willing to learn those things. And that means making mistakes and being complicated. The truth is, is anti-Semitism is as complicated right, is anti-Black racism, anti-Asian racism, you know, quite frankly, what I'm now calling anti-Muslim racism. I don't know how religious bigotry became a form of racial bias, but we in America exceed at racializing things, and so have we with Islamophobia, but that's okay. I wanted to fight Islamophobia anyway, and uh, making it a form of racism makes it that much easier uh, to align in my values. At the end of the day, though, here's what I would say. Let's be complicated. The truth is, is there is tensions between the Black and Jewish community because of anti-Semitism and because of anti-Blackness. But there's also true that there's tension between Black and Jewish communities because it, it, uh, 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 it works in the favor, right, of others who need those two communities divided and not aligned. It also exists because for Blacks and Jews, they lived in proximity to one another, right? Because Jews weren't fully white and they were placed as new immigrants, like most new immigrants, in proximity to Black America. And in that proximity is where the tension lies. We saw it between Black and Korean communities in LA, right? We've seen it between Caribbean and Black communities in Atlanta. Right, we see this play out um, uh, all the time. But again, and I'll shut up here. When it comes somehow, the tension between blacks and Jews versus blacks and Koreans rises somehow to this nefarious level, right, uh, for Jews that other communities would simply not be held to the same standard. And in my mind, that is unconscious anti-Semitism. But how would we know? We don't ever really spend any time trying to understand anti-Semitism. We spend most of our time telling people what anti-Semitism is. So speaking of messy, I'm going to move us into the, the messy Israel, Palestine, Gaza yes. side and into the, the word, which has, I think, become its own monster of a term, Zionist. Yes. And I differentiate that from Zionism. As a long critic of Zionism myself, and um, as somebody who long identified as an anti-Zionist, which I actually don't right now because of this, the way the term, and I'll say I feel yeah. it used as a slur, 
and see it. Uh, there was just a book talk canceled at a, a bookstore in Brooklyn um, by a, a book I can't wait to read by uh, Joshua Leifer because he was in conversation. It was going to be in conversation with a rabbi who identifies as Zionist. And, and I'll also say like Zionism means different things to different people. I have incredible colleagues like Peter Beinart who identify as Zionist and we have the same values. So like what is this? What I'm just going to leave it there. Yeah. And if you can dive into that. Yeah. Can of yeah, I wish, you know, I did a conversation on this um, a few months ago. I forget on on some PBS piece. It's super tough. Right. So, you know, here's the you know, the, the short question is, is, you know, is uh, are all forms of anti-Zionism. So we hear that anti-Zionism equates, uh, uh, equals anti-Semitism, right? Um, or we hear anti-Zionism isn't anti-Semitism. And um, look, um, the Jewish community is in the midst of a real uh, uh, dialogue, a wrestling dialogue, a fight, some would say, with one another, trying to understand, right, direction, values, um, it's a robust fight. And um, again, these fights aren't new. They happen in other communities too, right? Um, you know, other communities simply aren't invited into those fights in the same way, right? And so, um, or don't feel they have uh, permission to kind of walk into someone else's fight. I don't know which one that is, right? But it's something like that. Two, there's something very, very real happening in Palestine and Israel, and people feel urgency, right, to, 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 to bring this violence to a stop, right, to find a real long-term solution, uh, uh, to stop this kind of draconian moment, right? Everyone is also experiencing those urgencies. There is real questions around safety, right? There's all kinds of things happening there, and if we can, as leaders, hold those as real, right? It, we also begin to lose our way. But I want to come back to the Zionism, anti-Zionism. The shortest thing I can say right now, and folks can debate me later on this, is this. Not all anti- So in, again, from Eric Ward, um, the non-Jew, who has spent a lot of time wrestling with anti-Semitism, uh, not because I thought it was interesting, but because there were folks out there killing my friend right, uh, uh, physically attacking us, who were driven by this idea that they were in an existential war with the Jewish community, right, who, who uh, were uh, raising arms and using violence to battle what they called the Zionist occupational government. Those were white nationals, right, um, who saw me as a person of color as nothing more than a puppet of my Jewish puppet masters. I had to understand anti-Semitism, right? These folks led two of my friends out into the desert in outside of Las Vegas and executed both of them. These are folks who burned, you know, arsoned uh, uh, a friend of mine in Salem. She was burned alive in her home, right? With her roommate because she happened to be black and lesbian. This was not a hypothetical question for me. It was a very real part of my reality and the reality of thousands of others in, in my region. So we had to wrestle with this. And where I landed, not all anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic. And not all, uh, 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 so, so that's one. And some expressions of anti-Zionism right, are absolutely anti-Semitic, sometimes unconsciously, sometimes consciously. But how will we know if we refuse to get to understand what anti-Semitism really is? And in a true heartfelt way, I will share kind of a parallel allegory. and Folks can do with it what they will. I have dealt with anti-Black racism all my life. One of the ways that it mostly manifests in random conversation is through the conversation of crime, all right? Crime in cities. I don't know, maybe you've turned on the news lately and seen, you know, debates and footage about crime.
crime and how bad things are in the cities, right? And uh, what I know is that those discussions on crime are largely unconscious racism. And typically, when non-Black folks talk to me about crime and safety, they're typically expressing some form of anti-Blackness, particularly if they haven't done any work around understanding racism in America. It just doesn't take very many steps to go from a legitimate conversation on crime and safety, right, to a conversation that is steeped in anti-Black racism. I say the challenge is very equal around Palestine and Israel, right, mobilization, that the step between wanting a real solution, not steeped in violence, an immediate solution, not steeped in violence, in Palestine, Israel, to falling into the depths of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism takes less than two minutes. And that's because as leaders, we have shirked our responsibility to deepen our knowledge in those topics at a time that it's greatly needed. And what we've done instead is pander to the emotions of our base. And in that way, we have also absorbed, right, the cultural influences of white nationalism and Trumpism and their pseudo populism, which is feeding off the energy of one's base without it leading to any real solution that changes the actual conditions of those who are suffering in real time. And the debate around anti-Zionism and Zionism has fallen into that crevice in my opinion. I don't care if a person is Zionist or anti-Zionist. What I care about at the end of the day is that they are not anti-Semitic and that they're not Islamophobic because it undercuts the ability to bring a real solution. And I cannot think of two people uh, two peoples on this planet who are deserving of real solution and real support, not just the theatrical rhetoric from people around the world who are treating it as if we're in a fight, but we aren't the folks dying every day. And that's why we also take Islamophobia and anti-Semitism seriously. It's our job to lead in this. We have to lead. Absolutely. Um, so we're getting towards the top of the hour. Um, I wanted to, and we've had a couple of questions in the chat, to talk as well about, and you talk a lot about learning about anti-Semitism and some of the questions in the chat, and this is absolutely the case. It's really difficult these days with anti-Semitism being weaponized and being used as such a false accusation. So so commonly and then i kind of say the same thing of you know the way that you're a zionist or he's a zionist is being used as well which you know just kind of creates more confusion and somebody asked me the other day they said what do i do when i'm genuinely advocating for palestinian rights in the best of ways and i just get accused of being an anti-semite i said you know honestly i don't know because <laughs> i've never i've never solved that problem um, so if you could speak to that and how how can we genuinely learn about this and in a way that isn't um, isn't this uh, accus accusatory, right? You're an anti-Semite, you're a Zionist, you're a white supremacist, but how do we really learn about these intersecting forms of hatred in a constructive way? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> My friend, I am humbled enough to know if I had the answer on that one, uh, <laughs> I would be on a hunger strike right now uh, until folks listen to me. Um, <laughs> and and I, I, you know, uh, I struggle with that. Here's, here's, here's where I lean. We should know, right, that uh, if you look at any... Uh, uh, I think South Africa, uh, Northern Ireland uh, become very important case studies in this moment in this country. So I can't speak about the movements outside the U.S. right now because the, the context may be a little bit different. So I'm going to reserve that 
for movements and uh, uh, solidarity movements and resistance movements, uh, uh, governance movements here in, in the US. The, the, the truth is, is we have to understand um, we are reaching a point in this country where the question is, as I said, will we be a society grounded in inclusion or exclusion? When this question came to a head in South Africa, what I know, having now uh, spent time with the former head of uh, who oversaw the state of emergency in South Africa, a white Afrikaner who grew up right in the Afrikaner student movement, uh, uh, who oversaw the state of emergency, right? One of the things he made very clear to me in our conversation, right? A warning was do not at any moment doubt that people will try to divide minority communities and marginalized communities against one another if they seek to maintain an unjust rule, right? Uh, I don't have to say that. People have played risk. They've played monopoly in groups. They know group dynamics, uh, uh, cutting the deals. And um, that's at play right now. And one of the ways that that's in play is something called wedges, right? A wedge strategy. You try to wedge communities against one another because you're aware, right, that even communities carry the same biases as everyone else. So you want to wedge the LGBT, LGBTQ trans community uh, uh, away. You want to put a wedge between the environmental movement and labor. You want to put a wedge between the teachers union, right, and the uh, uh, parents teachers association. You want to wedge blacks and Asians. You want to wedge, you want to create tension and you don't have to create those tensions they happen naturally in a diverse society. You just have to be willing to exploit them. And so the rule that I was left with from that conversation is, is yes, we have to accept people will wedge tensions between our communities. Our job is to understand you can't create a wedge where none exists, right? And so our job, is to close the space on the wedge. And the easiest way to close the wedge is for two marginalized communities who are in complete disagreement with one another to keep physically and visibly showing up with one another, right? You show up, you yell, you scream at each other, but you show up once a week. I know a group right now of religious leaders who meet every Wednesday, every Wednesday for lunch. I think they've been meeting now for over 20 years, right? Primarily Muslim, Jew, and Christian. Now, these folks could talk about nothing for like the first five years. They literally had to show each, show each other pictures of families, right? That's all they could talk about were their children, right? And their families. These folks still meet right now. And it's a hard moment to be sitting in space together. And you can imagine the emotive state of their communities don't want them sitting around the table. It makes things complicated. So one, if you're serious, you symbolically show up with one another, even in deep disagreement. Two, you understand that you will get pressure from your community not to show up together. I don't say you cut deals with one another. I understand disagreement, but you show up. The second is, is though, you can't pander to your community. You have to bring complication and nuance back into the conversation. Sectarianism seeks to flatten and oversimplify things. That's what played out in Northern Ireland, right? To great horror and tragedy. We have the ability to create a different scenario right here in the United States that allies ourselves with those who are most vulnerable right now in Palestine and Israel. And it takes two simple things, but it takes the most courage. And because it takes the most courage, we often say those things don't matter. But really, that's our fears. We know it's hard.
that's such a wonderful place to end. And, and I want to say that that I feel more hopeful and stronger to be in this movement work with you and people like you who are willing to to get in the muck and um and do the work, principled yeah. and thoughtful. And I want to really thank you. And I want to let folks know that uh, when we send around the recording, I'm going to send around uh, as well a list of um, Eric's work and things that you can read and watch from him because I know I'm not finished um, and I, I hope you aren't either and want to dive in further. Yes, absolutely. And um, we all have real work to do, like, like really. And um, I encourage everyone, keep moving forward. Um, don't despair. Do not become the accelerationist that the white nationalists want us to be, right? Uh, another adoption of their attitudes and cultures. We are on the verge of an inclusive democracy that could have real influence and live up to its best self. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone.